Greetings, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Ed Steinfeld, the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. I really appreciate your being here today. I, of course, appreciate our panelists being here for this really important discussion. We're holding this for um, many reasons, but at least two very important reasons. One, we think it's very important to keep discussion going about the war in Ukraine. Uh, second, I think we have an opportunity here today, given the expertise on the faculty, to look at the war in Ukraine from, from slightly different angles from how um, I think it's, it's uh, frequently been covered in, um, in the media. And um, I think third, I want to provide an opportunity. There's a lot of expertise in, in the room. Um, as well beyond the panel, and I want to make sure that we are able to get that expertise in as well and, um, and included in the discussion. So what we're going to do today is have each of our four panelists, who I'll introduce in a moment, speak for 10 minutes or so, and then we're just going to open it up to discussion. Because the event is being uh, live streamed and, and recorded for our YouTube channel, I ask that uh, for those people in the room who are asking questions, please speak into the microphones that we'll have uh, circulating, and that way our online viewers will, will be able to um, hear as, as well. So let me just very quickly introduce our really terrific panel. Uh, first is Olga Biziakova. Uh, Olga is a postdoctoral fellow at the Watson Institute. She's a social and political anthropologist with expertise really in a variety of contemporary phenomena related to post-Soviet spaces. She gave a terrific presentation earlier today on the Russian middle class. Olga will be speaking today about the Belarus-Russia relationship and the regional context for the war. Lyle Goldstein, visiting professor at the Watson Institute, is an expert on Russian and Chinese security policy and military strategy and military capabilities. Uh, Lyle will be speaking today on the Russian and Chinese military and geopolitical angles on the war in Ukraine, as, as well as risks of escalation. Wilma James, senior advisor to the Brown Pandemic Center and professor of the practice at the Brown School of Public Health. He's an, an international thought leader in the area of biosecurity. And Wilma today will be discussing the issue of biosecurity and its connections to the war in Ukraine. And Rose McDermott, the David and Mariana Fisher University Professor of International Relations here at Watson and in the Department of Political Science is a renowned scholar of political psychology, deterrence, U.S. foreign policy, and gender insecurity. Rose will discuss today uh, the topics of de-escalation and national security. So with that, let me thank the panelists and turn it over to Olga. Olga, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation. And it's, uh, of course, a pleasure and a great honor to be part of this panel. And I would like to speak from the perspective of Belarus about the involvement of the country in the ongoing war and uh, the reaction of society and about the implications for the Belarusian democratic movement. And of course, I will also speak as a Belarusian citizen myself. And uh, I find that discussing these themes is both very important but also challenging for me since Belarus is a co-aggressor state in this war. And I think it is essential to acknowledge this, obviously, because uh, there is a collective responsibility associated with this, uh, but also because my uh, personal systematic involvement with this topic uh, is closely linked uh, to my position as a citizen. And in many points that I would like to raise today, I will draw on the outcomes of collaborative work, uh, which was accomplished as part of Peace Rep project. Uh, with a colleague of mine, uh, Alexander Bystrik, uh, who is a historian. Uh, he's a PhD candidate uh, at the CU. Um, but uh, in a way, this position of Belarus as simultaneously an object of Russia's oppression and its war accomplice uh, that exposes the importance of thinking about the con conflict from the regional perspective. Uh, that is the hierarchies that structure this region. Uh, as well as its embeddedness in the larger international context. And I believe that this perspective is relevant for understanding the build-up to this war, but also for finding uh, the ways out that would ensure a durable peace and the conditions for free and equitable development of this region. And uh, the way the all-out war uh, uh, unfolded, including the scale of uh, this war, 
among other things, was in enabled by the failure of the 2020 uh, Belarusian revolution and Lukashenko's ability to stay in power. Uh, and this became possible only due to the massive backing that Lukashenko received from Russia, which resulted in uh, his ultimate dependence on Kremlin. And subsequently, in 2022, the Belarusian regime provided the country's territory and infrastructure, including service, some service personnel, in the disposal of the Russian armed forces. And by this means, Belarus became uh, first a launching ground for Russia's assault towards Kyiv, uh, a supplier of arms, uh, a training hub for its mobilized soldiers, and most recently the, guard, uh, the ground for uh, the deployment of Russia's tactical nuclear weapons. And all these dire outcomes come from after a decade of pragmatic dealing uh, with Lukashenko uh, or with Belarus in which Lukashenko managed to present himself and was approached as a kind of intermediary figure vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And it also testifies to what can be called uh, indivisibility of uh, democracy, that is uh, the commonality and interconnection of democratic struggles across different contexts, but also the ine inevitable security risk of entrenching authoritarianism as appealing and successful as short terms compromises and deals might appear. Uh, and, but at the same time, the case of Belarus also highlights uh, the importance of acknowledging the multiplicity of actors and groups whose actions and positions have bearing on the war. Uh, in particular, the situation in Belarus in a paradoxical way suggests the influence that the society and public opinion can have on restraining the actions of political leadership even in the situation of mass repression and dictatorship. And as of now, the Belarusian army has not been directly involved in the war with the boots on the ground. And, uh, uh, but the discussions of these situations, they are often focused exclusively on the subject of Lukashenko's calculus in balancing relations with Russia and open, uh, often end up with crediting him for Belarus non-involvement and uh, resisting uh, Putin's uh, quote-unquote pressure. But I would like to, however, to point out to the role of the existing strong consensus on the rejection of direct participation of Belarusian army in the war that exists in Belarusian society, which, according to several independent polling teams, is shared across social and political uh, divides. That is, even those who support the current uh, Lukashenko's, uh, Lukashenko's regime disapprove the idea of Belarus entering the war. And considering Lukashenko's inherently vulnerable and unstable position after 2020, uh, as he never managed to reconsolidate and legitimize his power, this factor appears to be an important deterrent against such steps and also challenges the assumption about Kremlin exercising, uh, exerting pressure on him to send troops. And it is also important to underline that public opinion in Belarus is strikingly different from the picture in Russia, where since the beginning of the war, even the independent polling uh, agency Levanda Center shows a consistently high support for the war actions of the Russian army. And, uh, but nevertheless, while there is a consensus against the direct participation uh, on, the questions, on other questions related to the war, uh, Belarusian society proves to be rather divided. And again, According to the available estimates, around a third supports the actions of Russia, and support for Ukraine appears to be slightly larger, that is around 40 percent. But importantly, while there is a correlation, there is no a perfect overlap with the support for the regime. And the division of society also reflects how the war has been reshaping the Belarusian democratic movement exacerbating or reframing existing uh, cleavages, but also creating new divides and alliances. And uh, it also implies uh, the change of the endorsed methods and envisaged projects of the Belarusian democratic movement, as well as the emergence of new politi <coughs> political actors, uh, such as Belarusian volunteer fighter units uh, in Ukraine. And first of all, there is a growing gap between the people inside Belarus and those who joined mass exodus, including the organized democratic movement with the main center around Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, whose representatives are mostly in exile, if not in Belarusian prisons. And of course, there is a, a question of how relevant this opposition in exile can remain uh, for the situation in Belarus. 
Uh, but uh, when it comes to the organized opposition, it went through a significant transformation in terms of uh, its envisaged methods and agenda compared to 2020. For instance, the idea of using force uh, for Lukashenko's removal from power became widely accepted and, in fact, uh, it became mainstream, uh, although the imagined form and extent of uh, use of force vary. And there is also a growing salience of nationalist framing of the agenda and goals. And furthermore, the democratic change in Belarus is now understood as part of broader anti-imperial struggle against Russia in which the opposition states the shared goals with the struggle of Ukraine and explicitly ties Ukraine's anticipated victory to a possibility of regime change in Belarus. And the shift is most vividly embodied in the emergence of Belarusian volunteer fighter units as a new influential political uh, actor, uh, and uh, who, also uh, who also distanced themselves from uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Uh, thus, the war facilitated a certain drift away from explicitly civic, uh, peaceful, and inclusive character of 2020, uh, as the anti-regime movement increasingly acquires the traits of a classical national liberation movement. And there is also a shift from what is considered blueprint from orienting more towards like Solidarność or Velvet Revolution towards uh, thinking about Maidan as a blueprint that should be followed. Subsequently, this also raises a question about how these discourses, practices, and approaches fostered and legitimized in the situation of war then can be transposed in other contexts and feed into political visions and projects that are taken up by the anti-regime movement and how it can also create a basis for subverting democracy and inclusiveness, as it was demonstrated in uh, analysis of other historical examples, uh, such as uh, the work by Peter Holquist. Uh, it is also unclear to what extent these new principles and visions uh, resonate uh, with those uh, who constituted the broad anti-regime coalition in 2020, and whether this agenda is able to mobilize and bring together citizens in a comparable, uh, at a comparable scale. And so just uh, to conclude, uh, at the same time, there is a growing uh, concern uh, that the post-war arrangement may include some form of a deal with Lukashenko, uh, these anxieties are uh, additionally fueled by the fact that Ukrainian, the Ukrainian government remains ostensibly distant uh, from the Belarusian uh, democratic movement with some more recent exceptions, but also occasionally uh, notes towards the dictator. And as Ukraine is forced to fight this devastating war against the brutal and resourceful aggressor within the limits of its territory, such quote-unquote pragmatic uh, solutions may appear ev ever more plausible. But similar pragmatic logic underpins the call for striking a deal with Putin, which Ukraine is vehemently and uh, rightfully objects. And the representatives of the Belarusian democratic movement, and most prominently Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, in turn aim to argue that the future security architecture should also include uh, democratic Belarus. And just I would like to conclude with a suggestion, or uh, rather reiterate suggestion that was uh, expressed by many other people that aiming to return to some form of the pre-war status quo will hardly uh, yield any sustainable solution. As previous cycles of appeasement, uh, it will just yield a build-up for a larger escalation, and that creating conditions for lasting uh, peace and free and equitable development for the region uh, can be achieved only by rearranging the actually existing power structure in the region. Uh, and also finding more equitable forms of international embedding and participation. And this is the task that clearly transcends the post-Soviet uh, region. Great. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thanks, Olga. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me on the panel here. Uh, mostly a, uh, a China specialist yesterday was hosting a talk on uh, China-Japan relations, but I'm glad to weigh in here with some thoughts uh, on the Ukraine war, which I followed quite closely. Um, in fact, you know, I have been following the Ukraine situation before the war started and uh, had written this piece in National Interest. You, you can look that up. But I said that, that Europe's future hangs in the balance. This was in uh, 2019 when Putin and Zelensky here met face-to-face. 
that was an exceedingly important moment. I think a lot of diplomatic opportunities were missed. Uh, and I think this war did not need to happen, honestly. Um, I also, uh, well, fast forward to October 2023, there's the uh, defense minister, Russian defense minister in Beijing, uh, Shoigu. Uh, and I was also in Beijing in the spring there. That's me in the lower right. And uh, one of the things I did while in China was I found uh, sort of China's top, basically their top Russia experts, and interviewed them pretty carefully about their thoughts about the war. So let me get to that in a minute. Um, but let, let, uh, just a few thoughts on the war, because uh, you know I do. I am a military analyst, and um, you know I, I, I guess I would summarize it by saying this war has unfolded maybe in four phases. Uh, the first phase, you all remember well, the, the Ukrainians very courageously defended their capital and drove the Russians back, um, uh, really inspired the world with their courage, uh, and left a lot of burning Russian tanks in, in their wake. Um, and uh, this was followed by a very uh, <clears throat> intensive fighting over the summer of 2022. And then in the fall, you had, uh, you had a a, a quite a brilliant set of moves, both in the south and in the north, where Ukraine succeeded in taking back some quite substantial territory, actually. This raised a lot of hopes that, that we might be nearing the end of the war, uh, that, that simply you could see some sort of like coll catalytic collapse of the Russian army or something like that. And, and here you see uh, sort of a triumphant liberation of this Russian city, Kherson. Oh, sorry, Russian, Ukrainian city, Kherson. Um, so that was a, a great moment uh, and, and raised really a lot of expectations for this third phase where we finally saw a lot of uh, Western uh, uh, heavy equipment coming into Ukraine, including, you know, hundreds of tanks, heavy tanks, uh, artillery uh, and so forth. And, and uh, unfortunately, though, that third phase counteroffensive really, I think, we, we have to say it's been mostly a failure here. We've only mo moved a few miles, really, along the front here. Uh, as, uh, as you can see in this picture, a lot of that Western equipment caught in these uh, prepared defenses. Now, uh, we have the prospect now of uh, sending aircraft in, uh, but I don't have very high expectations that that will change the situation on the battlefield. And now it's the Russians who are on the offensive here, and this is the uh, current major battle that's developing around the city of Avdeka, Avdevka, which is uh, very far uh, toward the east. In fact, it's right, right near Donetsk, actually, which is, you know, in a way what, where all of this started. Uh, so in this fourth phase, we'll see what happens. It, it, a lot of people are concerned that Ukraine's uh, army may be at the breaking point. So we'll have to see. You know, I can comment further if you're interested, but I think uh, People are curious about the Chinese angle, so let me speak to that for a few minutes. Um, well, as you can see in this rather dramatic photo uh, that unfolded just before I arrived in Beijing myself, but this was Xi Jinping arriving in, in uh, Moscow back in March 2023. And of course, that was a, a huge gesture of support. Um, China has refused to condemn the war, and they've said right along that a major cause of the war was NATO expansion and U.S. hostility toward Russia. You know, as I was told to my face when I was in Beijing the, by one of their senior uh, Russia experts, he, he said very clearly that, that the U.S. had transgressed all of Russia's red lines and, and even their core interests. You know, that has a special meaning in Chinese. Uh, so she had gone to Moscow. Uh, just now, Putin has been in Beijing, as you know, for the uh, Belt and Road Summit. Now, all that said, I, I think it's very important to note that, and then I was told this emphatically uh, many times when I was in China, that, that, um, that China would, under no circumstances, send weapons into this war. So I think that's, that's a really positive element of restraint there. We should keep that in mind, because think, think about that the other way. What, what if China decided to go all in, as it were, and send, uh, you, know, its full, uh, you know, its full capabilities for, uh, 
for sending armaments. I mean, you can imagine that would uh, might well change the change the battle very quickly in Russia's favor. So let's please keep that in mind. Um, now, quite concretely, there's no question that uh, Russia is getting substantial support here. Uh, Russia-China trade is is really booming. It's on track to. Uh, probably exceed $200 billion, which is a major jump. Um, there's a lot of militarily useful things moving across the border, uh, you know, things like body armor. There, you know, Chinese drones are ubiquitous on the battlefield, on both sides, interestingly. Uh, but the Russians are using them skillfully. Uh, I've read that uh, the Chinese have sent a lot of excavators over, and, you know, you may wonder what is what's the point of an ex excavator in a war, but if you see that the latest Ukrainian counteroffensive was stymied on those Russian defenses, well, how did they build the defenses so quickly and so effectively? Well, really, with Chinese excavators. So, um, you know, I, I can elaborate further on some of the things I heard in Beijing, but um, in including that they. Uh, you know, I was told again by one of their most senior Russia experts that they definitely would not accept um, Russian annexation of territory. So, so you know, I think that's encouraging. Uh, they were also extremely concerned about a nuclear escalation. Um, let me turn to that too. I think we should all be concerned with that. Oh, excuse me. One more point I want to make on China is that, you know, a lot of people ask, well, what is what is the meaning of this for Taiwan? And I'm I'm working really hard on that question. I have a series in the Diplomat. I think we'll have a piece out again, another piece out this week. But you can see that piece in the middle, so you can look for that series. But all of these articles in Chinese, you know, suggest different angles of this war where China is learning some things. And and yes, you know, I do think China may behave more cautiously and may approach in general the use of force more cautiously. That's that's good for sure. But I also fear that they are learning a lot of lessons, including how to counter some of our latest weapons like HIMARS and things like that. So, you know, I can elaborate if people are interested. But so on escalation, I'll just say this, and I know I think uh, Professor McDermott will also have a lot to say on this. But, uh, you know, I think escalation could come in many forms. Uh, you know, here's the country Moldova, which I was fortunate to visit a few times in uh, 2019 before the pandemic. And I can tell you uh, this war could very easily spread to Moldova. So it could could expand in that way to, to Belarus. Couldn't, can't rule that out. I'm glad we got that angle. But, but I mean, here's a picture of Kiev. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, Kiev could look like Gaza City. It could. <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, it could, though. So we don't want to go there. Um, and here is a you know, an assassination that took place, uh, this is becoming more common. And I think that's also a direction this war could go in. Uh, so there are some dark directions and the hints of, of uh, escalation in that respect. But let me raise this, and these are all kind of things I've put on Twitter here, because I've been following closely all the nuclear threats that I've seen in the Russian press. And, and there are a lot, folks, <laughs> you know, really dozens. Um, and some of them by, you know, very credible sources here. Um, so. You know, I, I, I can walk through some of these, but a lot of them explain that to their estimate, you know, yes, nuclear weapons really would be helpful in this war. And that, that's a very disturbing thing to read, let me tell you. And I, I, unfortunately, I believe our side has been playing this down dramatically, um, you know, for political reasons. I don't know if that's wise. Uh, and th this indeed was really not uh, carried, really, in the Western press, uh, not in the mainstream press. But here is one of uh, Putin's, really, one of his closest advisors um, over time, Sergei Karganov. Uh, you know, have a look at what he said. Um, you know, it's really shocking. This was in June, so just a few months ago. And by the way, I just, you know, I watch a lot of Chinese uh, military television. I just happened to catch that Karganov is in, was in Beijing last week. So. That's disturbing, too. <laughs> um, all right. I think that's uh, what I wanted to say. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Lyle. And now we turn to Wilma Chains. Nice to be here. Uh, I must tell you that I'm a South African, trained as a scholar and academic, but I served nine years in the South African parliament. 
and I was the chairman of the opposition party. Um, I do not admire my country's stance on Ukraine. So I wanted to talk about biosecurity risks and here some background points. Firstly, Russia has had a history of propagating false claims about the United States biological weapons. Examples include allegations that the United States created AIDS and deployed quote unquote killer mosquitoes in Afghanistan. Russia now falsely accuses the United States and Ukraine of developing biological weapons, despite the fact that Ukraine operates public health laboratories that collaborate with the United States uh, uh, doing peaceful disease-related research. After the Soviet Union dissolved, many former republics faced threats from unsecured weapons and unemployed weapons scientists. To address this, the United States initiated what's known as a Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, the CTR program in 1991, to help destroy weapons of mass destruction and redirect weapon scientists towards peaceful work. The United States and partners fortified biosurveillance, biosecurity, and public health research in former Soviet states, including extensive collaboration with Russia itself. And finally, as a background point, though Russia temporarily halted its bioweapons disinformation due to this cooperation at the time, it resumed such claims in 1995. Under Vladimir Putin, these allegations have escalated and they've been amplified by COVID-19 distrust and mistrust and are now being used as a false pretext for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So what, may you ask, are the key biosecurity risks presently? Firstly, laboratory damage. Russia could deliberately or accidentally strike facilities housing dangerous pathogens like anthrax or Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Ukraine has a history of anthrax outbreaks, which have been greatly mitigated by vaccination, vaccinating livestock since 1990. And anthrax is a bacteria, as you know, and it is a high consequence one. Second risk is uh, related to uh, workforce. Attacks could debilitate critical laboratory and veterinary work workforces needed to ensure biosecurity. Biosecurity is to keep dangerous pathogens out of criminal and state criminal hands. Biosafety is to protect health workers from being infected. Okay, it's a difference, but they're obviously linked. So to say that um, interruptions could prevent livestock vaccination, um, risking anthrax and other outbreaks. The third risk is a crippled biosurveillance itself. The conflict has displaced key epidemiological monitoring personnel. Rural areas face inadequate surveillance, Rapid outbreak identification and attribution and containment is essential, as you know, to prevent uncontrolled spread. Further risk is intentional pathog pathogen release. Intelligence suggests Russia maintains illegal bioweapons capabilities and it has an unbroken line uh, from the Soviet Union days to today in having a bioweapons capability. Uh, and nobody's been inside from the outside in the laboratories for probably over 30 years. So we don't exactly know what goes on there. So uh, strategic deployment of agents like African swine fever could severely damage Ukraine's economy. Russia could then blame Ukraine and United States. And finally, terrorist acquisition. Porous security could enable terrorist groups to steal dangerous materials from compromised laboratories. So what then are the mitigation strategies? Firstly, to safely eliminate non-critical pathogen samples to prevent accidental release as recommended by the World Organization, uh, the World Health Organization. To relocate essential pathogen samples necessary for research to secure facilities outside of conflict zones. Destroy non-critical specimens on site to avoid transportation of specimen risks. Follow established protocols for decontamination and the disposal of hazardous, hazardous biomaterials. 
and finally provide transportation and security support to complete removal operations. In terms of restoring workforce capabilities is to establish protected alternative laboratory sites in quiet regions to maintain essential operations. Provide salaries, housing and resources to retain skilled scientists and technicians. Set up mobile veterinary clinics with security escorts to keep livestock vaccination coverage high, which is really essential, uh, and to provide logistical and security support to enable disease surveillance teams to continue operating across Ukraine. And finally, to reinforce international norms against the use of bioweapons to deter Russian attacks. Galvanize the UN Security Council, uh, which is distracted uh, presently by an important thing, but still to galvanize the UN Security Council to unequivocally condemn any deployment of biological and chemical weapons in Ukraine or anywhere else. To build consensus for multilateral economic sanctions and criminal charges for Russia's leaders should they authorize weapons of mass destruction deployment. Maintain unified NATO signals and improved intelligence sharing, intelligence sharing to prevent Russia from underestimating international resolve and response. A final series of comments about how to address Russia's disinformation campaign. First, the traditional approach, as you know, is to counter disinformation with correct information. However, this is often ineffective against Russia's fire hose of false falsehoods. And it's a really good expression, a fire hose of falsehoods. Once lodged in people's minds, disinformation is very difficult to dislodge. Instead, inoculate and pre-bunk. So, grammatically terrible word, but to pre-bunk. By informing the public that pro propaganda will emerge before it's released. Reveal specific Russian outlets and narratives in advance to reduce its impact. Third, enforce social media terms of service aggressively to lower the volume and spread of disinformation. Fourth, to encourage allies to enforce terms of service sanction the Russian outlets spreading disinformation, and find those publishing false narratives. I've lost count of the numbers, but I think it's fifth. Promote <laughs> persuasive pro-Ukraine NATO messaging that supports unity objectives rather than directly refuting Russian claims. Then cite a variety of international sources. Do not counter propaganda with the United States voices, but spread the voices. And finally, to coordinate diverse global voices to jointly reject Russia's storylines before and as they emerge. Multilateral inoculation and condemnation is more powerful than unilateral um, inoculation and condemnation. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you. And now, Rose McDermott. Yeah. Rose. And I will stay here if that's okay. Um, so the first thing I should say is I am not an expert in um, either Russia or Ukraine, um, but I do work on international relations, and so I was asked to talk about some of the issues related to escalation and national security. So um, I'll start with issues of um, escalation, and there's really the Russian side of this, and there's the American side of this. So we had a recent graduate student, Dan Post, who's now at the Naval War College, and he did his dissertation on the policy that's called escalate to de-escalate, which is this notion that um, in order to de-escalate and stop a conflict and make it uh, end or be less violent, what you need to do is actually make things a lot worse, and then you'll intimidate the other guy into backing off, surrendering, capitulating, giving you what you want, um, and then that'll stop the conflict. So one of the things that was very interesting is he went around and uh, interviewed uh, very senior American officials, including those in nuclear command, because he himself had come out of nuclear command. And what he found was this universal belief in the American military command that, first of all, escalate to de-escalate doesn't work. It should not be our policy. By the way, the Russians really do believe it. It is their policy. And so therefore, we have to act as though it is our policy, even though we know it doesn't work, because it's their policy. So it's this sort of notion of reacting to a set of beliefs that the Russian um, military and political structure holds. 
Um, and so you see the discrepancy between what they know is going to work, which is not to escalate to, you know, somehow force the other side to capitulate, uh, versus the belief that that's what we have to do in order to contain the conflict. Um, with regard to escalation itself, I completely agree with Professor Goldstein that the risk of nuclear escalation is a lot greater than uh, American media and American political um, operatives have discussed. And you see this in a lot of the Russian literature and a lot of the Russian discussions. So um, I recently heard a talk by uh, Bob Legvold, who's a very senior, um, actually started as a Sovietologist, now Russian expert, speaking about a series of conversations he had had with Alexei Abartov, um, who's a, a, academic in, a prominent academic in Russia, um, about exactly this belief that, that the notion is that somehow many on the Russian side believe that the way to end the war in Ukraine is to actually escalate the war. That by um, making it more deadly, more lethal, it will force the Ukrainians to surrender. Um, and you could see that, you know, basically from the outset of the war, right, the Russians go in to Kiev, you know, they think they're going to just basically do a blitzkrieg through in three days and take over and it's, you know, going to be no problem. Obviously, that didn't work. But that notion that you can somehow um, um, use overwhelming force to subvert opposition on the part of the Ukrainians um, appears to be at least an underlying notion in the Russian strategy. Now. On the American side, again, you have this notion, at least in American senior military commanders, that this is not something that works, that on average, escalating a conflict serves to escalate the conflict. It doesn't serve to actually stop the conflict or de-escalate the conflict. And so you have this real challenge of how do you de-escalate a conflict if the way that the other side is doing it is to actually escalate it and you don't want to continue to escalate it. Obviously, the way that the United States has been involved in supporting the war in Ukraine is bit by bit, right? Like we start and say, okay, we're going to give you a bunch of money, and then we're going to give you some weapons, and then we wait and see what happens, and then maybe, maybe we give you a little bit fancier weapons, and then we see if there's a kind of retaliation, um, not so much against Ukrainians, but against NATO forces or against, you know, the Americans. Okay, there's not a reaction. We're going to give you a little bit fancier weapons. Now we're going to give you planes. Um, and it's this sort of um, what Janice Grossstein calls uh, learning by doing. You do a little bit, and then you wait and see what happens. You do a little bit, and you wait and see what happens. But obviously, the Americans have not wanted to go in, for good reason, with ground troops um, in a way that they see would escalate the conflict, right? That they believe that that's exactly how you would escalate it against the Russians. Um, but you see the Russian discussion being along these lines of like, oh, we can just use teeny tiny nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons on the front, and you know it'll just stop the Ukrainians and they'll surrender. And I think that um, the real challenge is once you have the use of nuclear weapons, there's just no way to know where that stops and how that stops and if it stops. Um, and so obviously you want to prevent that from happening to begin with. Now, to the second part about national security, again, you have the Russian side of the equation, to some degree the Ukrainian side of the equation, and the American side of the equation. Um, I think one of the real challenges is now the American side of the equation, right? The American side of the equation being whether or not the American Congress will continue to financially support the Ukrainians uh, across the duration of what is appearing to be a long war and an increasingly long war of attrition. We see, um, for example, this week, the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, saying, ah, you know, Ukraine, we're over that. What we really need to concentrate on is Israel. Like, Israel is the big thing we need to be concerned about. We're not going to worry so much about Ukraine. Obviously, um, you know, uh, said head of the Senate, McConnell, saying, no, 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 we need to combine these things. But it's not clear that this Congress will continue to support um, the financial uh, wherewithal of the Ukrainians the way that they have in the past. Um, this reflects a real shift in the Republican understanding of national security that is very divergent from what it was, you know, even 20 years ago, when the Republicans were the ones who wanted to do all this intervention, you know, democracy promotion thing. Remember, George Bush was going to promote democracy through the Middle East and so on. 
um, now you have a very isolationist party. And that's not independent of the fact that the consequences of the interventionist policy in Afghanistan and in Iraq didn't work out so well. Um, but you have um, uh, a Congress that's unwilling to spend the money for national security in the same way that it has in the past. I think that, um, you know, this may be cynical, but I suspect that part of Putin's strategy with regard to the Americans is not just what everybody says about waiting out the Western alliance is going to fracture, the Americans aren't going to give us support, but it's just waiting for Donald Trump to get reelected, right? Because if Donald Trump gets reelected, not only is there no money going to the Ukrainians, he's handing Ukraine to the Russians on a silver platter, right? Like, it's not a rocket science to predict that that's what he is interested in, that's what he's going to do, that's what he wants to do. And that may be Putin's plan. It may be um, just something that he's hoping will happen. But the, certainly the disinformation campaign um, that Professor James talked about on the Russian side is not independent of trying to fracture the American electorate as well. Um, so you have these national sec security concerns on the part of the American public reflected through American Congress that has huge influence on the likelihood of victory in Ukraine but over which the Ukrainians have almost no influence, right? I mean, Zelensky comes and he's, you know, an amazing communicator. He's like, he looks the part. He's got the, you know, orange, he's got the olive green shirt and he's very, you know, commanding. But in and of himself, he cannot convince the American Congress to give him the money. Um, and yet his success will depend not only on the money, but on the weapons. The one thing that I'll, that I'd also like to raise, and you know, I'm, I'm curious about Professor Goldstein's response to this, but you know, if you imagine that the Americans are invested in both the war in Ukraine and the war in Israel, and I think that they are, I think a lot about supply chains if the Chinese were to attack Taiwan. <laughs> you know, if the Chinese decide that this is the moment that the Americans are heavily distracted, and I don't think it's unlikely that the Russians are very invested in American distraction in the Middle East. They certainly are. But if that distraction goes forth to a three-front war, I'm not sure we have the weapons and supplies, much less the manpower, to sustain the kind of financial, logistical, uh, weaponry, and manpower commitment that something like that would take. And yet it's unclear where the breaks on any of this are going to come. Um, I'd like to make one more comment on the Russian side and then, I'll <clears throat> and then I'll stop, which is about Russian notions of national security. The policy, the official policy of the Russians is that they would not use nuclear weapons unless they felt like it was an existential threat. But they have not defined what they think an existential threat is or what an existential threat would constitute. So there's no way to know that this is the red line over which they would use nuclear weapons and this one isn't. I think it's safe to assume that Putin aligns Russian existential security with his own personal existential security um, and clearly manages to rule in part by terrorizing those around him into uh, submission. Technically, their um, nuclear control is different than the American nuclear control. The American nuclear control is one guy, right? So. You know, Donald Trump has the key when he was president, and Joe Biden does now. Um, Bill Perry, who was a former Secretary of Defense under the Clinton administration, is 95, incredibly acute, and his life's work now is all about changing this policy so that it's not just one guy who can control nuclear weapons. In the case of Russia, it's three, right? It's the president, it's the chief of the general staff, and it's the head of the defense system. But do you really believe that any of those two other guys are going to refuse if Putin wants to do it, right? So in, in essence, it's not that different. So if, if we assume that Putin's notion of existential identity is, is the same with his notion of Russian existential identity, his vision of himself in his own historical legacy is that he's the you know new instantiation of Peter the Great, right? He wants to take back Crimea. He wants to make Russia back to what it was before the Cold War. I think there's uh, important reasons um, for why that's the case, given his experience um, in Berlin at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union um, and his aversion to the chaos that followed at that time. But it also means that his notion of existential 
is much broader than just Russia, right? It may actually include parts of Ukraine or Crimea or, you know, other parts of going into Moldova um, that the West may not necessarily think of as Russian territory, but he would. Um, and so I think that the notion of what constitutes Russian national security is much more impenetrable in some sense um, than the part on the West. Um, the final comment I'll make is just that when we think about these wars and how they're conducted, and Professor Goldstein had some amazing pictures about the early um, uh, fight in Ukraine, the Russians don't fight according to international laws of armed conflict. And I see Nina Tannenwald in the back, and she can speak to this much more um, uh, knowledgeably than I can. But when you unleash a different set of laws of war fighting against a group of people that try to subscribe to it, it makes it an asymmetric conflict in a way that's very difficult to de-escalate. Um, so I will stop there and um, open it up uh, for others. Thank you, Ruth. So we will open it up now to questions. I ask again that you speak into the microphone, and uh, we can start with Nina Tannenwald. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel. My question is to Lyle Goldstein. Uh, I mean, it's sort of to all of you, but let me pose it to, to you, Lyle. Um, I mean, it seems to me we need to be thinking now about how this war ends. And I'm curious in your discussions with the Chinese, uh, your interviews, uh, I mean, do they have a vision of how this war ends? I mean, what is, and what is their idea of how this war should come to an end? Is there any discussion of a negotiated solution? Would they, you know, put pressure on Russia? Um, I mean, what, what came through in your interviews with them about the, the end of the war? Yeah, uh, thanks very much, uh, Nina. Well, I mean, at some level, I think that they, um, you know, they are eager to play a role. Um, they actually, when I was there, they were just closing the deal between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, which I think, you know, is truly impressive. Um, and I think if we think about how that came about, although I don't, I don't know that we know all the details, but the Chinese approach was sort of put everybody in a room, you know, serve them all, all kinds of treats and, uh, you know, say encouraging words and, and, you know, keep moving and keep talking. Um, you know, I, I uh, uh, another colleague from Naval War College, uh, Nick Vazdev, uh, put, uh, he uh, described a year ago that, that maybe the Dayton Accord sort of process. Anyway, I mean, I think, Nina, it starts with sitting down, and that's the way the Chinese uh, conceptualize it. They want a kind of clean table. Um, you know, when I sat with Xing Wang Cheng, who was, again, one of their leading Russia specialists, you know, he, he gave me an hour-long lecture on how China's position evolved. And he said with, I think, considerable bitterness that, that um, I think a lot of his recommendations and his warnings were not taken seriously at the top and that they, the Chinese underestimated the true possibility of war. But he, he got really um, red in the face to demand, you know, that, that we realize, uh, we Americans, that is, that, that China had put forth its you know, whatever, a 10-point proposal or whatever, uh, and that this, um, the first point was, you know, a state's territorial integrity should be respected, and he said that was a kind of message that China was going to try to be sort of, as, as it were, fair-minded. But, you know, on the other side, of course, are there, all their national interests are stacked up with Russia. So I'll just leave you with the idea, which I think kind of sums up the larger point that I got in China, which was that, you know, it's not that China needs Russia to win, but they also definitely do not want Russia to lose. And, you know, the, the implication that they would do what it takes to make sure that Russia does not lose. Olga, would you be, could you offer any comments on the Ukrainian politics of negotiation? Yes, uh, which point? Well, the, what the politics look like inside Ukraine of sustaining the war versus beginning some kind of negotiation talks? Is, is there any political sentiment within Ukraine that's in favor of a negotiation? Um, 
let me, of course, not pretend to be have an expertise on the, the politics, uh, internal politics in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, what I can speak about is, of course, that there is uh, also societal con consensus on rejection of current uh, a kind of striking a deal with the current status quo among the Ukrainian society. So it's not simply the a kind of uh, decisions that political elite can uh, make without uh, thinking or independently from society. And I think it's important to understand that uh, this rejection of the peace deal comes from the very clear picture of uh, how the uh, actually uh, the country under Russian occupation looks like, which I don't think that Kiev represents it, but it represented by Bakhmut, by Avdiivka, and by Bucha, or by such areas as Saltivka in Kharkiv. But actually, we have also examples of Russia raising cities to the ground in Syria. So there is very clear understanding of what this appeasement entails, what this appeasement entails uh, for the population. And this, I think, that what fuels this rejection of the, with the current status quo. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Michael Kennedy. I appreciate the, the direction of the conversation now because it is, seems very easy to be able to talk about what's feasible in terms of resolving the war without involving Ukrainians themselves. And I think, you know, I was just calling up some of my tweets recently. So here's a good example of the way in which the foreign minister speaks about this war, Dmitro Kuleba. He said, it's absolutely normal not to have fear, but to be afraid. We should all be afraid, but we shouldn't be paralyzed by fear, he says. He says, those who fear Russia and submit to its blackmail are not realists. They are rather cowering in the information war that Russia prosecutes. So I have two questions and comments for anyone. The first is how do, with each of your perspectives, do you take into account Ukrainian dispositions? And I think Olga's response illustrates something, that the Ukrainians are not going to compromise. And in fact, in the last time I heard this kind of debate, Ukrainians were not attacking Russia, quote unquote, and now they are. They are attacking and trying to retake Crimea. And whether they are absolutely saying they are sending drones to bomb Moscow, they are leaving that ambivalence properly in the air. So A, how do Ukrainian strategies, intentions, convictions figure in your estimations of how to end the war? And then secondly, um, I can't remember. <laughs> okay. Okay. Why does the panel start with the first question? Thank you, Michael. Any? Well, um, I mean, to, to your point, Michael, I think that Olga's comment is really salient, which is that ultimately it is up to the Ukrainians, right? It's up to them whether or not they're willing to fight whether or not they're willing to compromise, whether or not they're willing to have a ceasefire. That said, there are armies and nations that have had to stop fighting because they are completely eviscerated, right? So then the question becomes the extent to which Russia is willing to engage in total war. You know, the world hasn't seen total war in a long time, but we may see it in Gaza, right? Like, we don't know if that's what's going on there now. I mean, if it will go to that full extent, but it might. Um, and so, you know, at some point without sufficient support from NATO and the Americans, uh, Ukraine will run out of sufficient resources. But to me, that's not the end, right? Like, okay, let's say that they quote unquote surrender. 
Um, the Ukrainians didn't stop fighting the Second World War till 1947. So what I think about when I think about the Ukrainians losing the war because they don't have enough formal support is that it's going to look like the Americans in Afghanistan or the Soviets in Afghanistan or the British in Afghanistan <laughs> or, you know, pick your poison. Um, the Americans in Vietnam, right? Just because you um, force a population to surrender does not mean that that population will submit to obeisance, right? They will continue to fight a guerrilla war. And I can't imagine that the Ukrainians wouldn't continue to fight a guerrilla war. Now, you know, does that mean that they bring the Russian state down? Maybe not in a year or five years, maybe in 20 years. You know, you just don't know. So, yes, I mean, I think that the concern on the American side has always been about giving them weapons that they could send into Moscow, because then Moscow would decide that who they're going to retaliate against is not Ukraine, but the United States, right? So if we give them, you know, some set of planes that allow them to penetrate into Moscow and drop bombs on Moscow, will Moscow then retaliate with some kind of ICBM against New York City or whatever? Then it's a really different game, right? Um, and that's why the United States has been... Uh, more reticent than it would have been otherwise, right? If the Russians didn't have nuclear weapons, we would have just gone in and on the ground, but we didn't for that reason. So that's my, that's my sense of it, but I could be wrong. You know, I don't feel like I'm highly confident of that perspective. Go ahead, Bob. Well, yeah, thank you, Michael. I, I mean, a couple thoughts. I mean, just reflecting on Kuleba's statement there, I, I'm struck by you know, to me, uh, Ukraine's leaders have all along regarded this as an information war, war basically. But this is a real war. <laughs> it's not an information war. It's not about what the papers are saying. You know, that's kind of been a lot of their strategy, and they've been quite successful there. But unfortunately, the real war is not going well. And uh, frankly, I've been saying for a decade that, and this is exactly what President Obama said, is that, you know, uh, Russia has vast firepower superiority and there's really not much that can be, not be done about it. And uh, I would urge all of you to read this uh, remarkable article in Time magazine that just came out, sort of, that has some interviews with um, Zelensky's inner circle, which is pretty amazing, but talk about Ukrainian perspectives. But it says, um, it says, Zelensky's belief in Ukraine's ultimate victory over Russia has hardened into a form that worries some of his advisors. It is immovable, verging on the messianic, he deludes himself, one of his closest aides tells me in frustration. We're out of options. We're not winning. But try telling him that. You know who that sounds that's, like? That's really, uh, that, that's really disturbing. Well, Rose, this says that it comes from one of his top advisors. No, 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 I mean historically. Do you know who that sounds like? That sounds like the entire inner circle of Churchill mm -hmm. in 1939. I think Olga has a well, question. Yes, I would like to uh, thank you for bringing this interview, which really uh, made some headlines. And I think one would be astonished. And there was this uh, highlight citation that um, uh, no one like me believes in the victory, and that there was actually in the social media a wave of statements that the president believe you are not alone. Uh, so I'm not sure, like, and giving this citation from a kind of anonymous source from the top circle, I'm not sure whether it reflects the situation in which a kind of Zelensky in uh, his own illusion of uh, rooting uh, to, to, uh, to resist Putin while everyone would like otherwise. I think this uh, form of relations is more applicable to Putin, who is clearly a thing in <laughs> itself, and then clearly trying to uh, create strategies of interacting with the thing in itself becomes a challenging task. Thank you. One more, you, did you want to? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ethan, you had a hand up earlier. Yes. Uh, Ethan Pollock in the Department of History. Um, thank you. It's really interesting and depressing. Um, I'm, I'm curious about this question of escalation and just, I think Lyle said something about the Chinese sort of not quite wanting the Ukrainians to win, but certainly not wanting the Russians to lose. And I'm wondering about the American perspective. If so much of American policy is based on a concern about the escalation of weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, et cetera, 
it seems like the most likely scenario in which Russia would escalate like that would be if uh, Ukraine were winning. That is, if it, then it would become an existential threat almost by definition for Putin. In which case, if that is a governing action of the Americans or a governing force for American activity, uh, then it would suggest that the United States also doesn't want Ukraine to win. Uh, because if it's about fear of nuclear weapons, we don't want Ukraine <coughs> to win. Uh, and so it seems like a lot of American policy is actually based on this stalemate. And uh, I wonder whether the panelists would care to comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think you've got it exactly right. I mean, uh, in our hearts, we want Ukraine to um, to prevail, but we in the back of our minds, we, we know that uh, some kind of massive defeat uh, of, U of uh, Russian forces might, you know, might entail nuclear escalation. And, you know, I use the word might, and I think on the other side of the debate, people say, well, the Russians are clearly bluffing. You know, we've got to call their bluff. But, you know, I, my attitude, and I spent my life studying nuclear strategy, did my dissertation on it, but, um, you know, if you're calling, if you're saying they're bluffing and you're wrong, we might just lose our planet. I mean, we might lose a few cities in, in the Baltics or Ukraine or, or Poland, but we might lose the whole planet. So in either case, I'm going to be cautious. And, you know, to the Biden administration's credit, I think they have been cautious. And I think most people realize the importance of that caution. I hope it continues. Um, you know, I'm one who thinks that, um, uh, yeah, that, that we're, we're very close to that, to nuclear use, on we have been. And, and by the way, Biden himself said in October 2022, he said, we're closer now to the apocalypse than we have been in 60 years. Yeah, wow. So, you know, I think all, all due caution is necessary. And, and it's one reason that, uh, you know, uh, in some ways, in the back of our minds, you know, we may not want to say this is not polite, but we have to hope in a way that Ukraine doesn't prevail. By the way, you know, I um, just sorry to drag this out, but I do think that Ukraine has scored an immense victory. They have really humiliated Vladimir Putin, no question about it. And I think they can be exceedingly proud of that. We probably need to pocket that victory and, and call an end to this. I mean, by the way, you know, at least half a million people, to my estimate, are dead. I'm not even counting, you know, all the orphans and the wounded. It's going to cost hundreds of billions to trillions, maybe, to rebuild Ukraine. Let's get a start on that. Um, uh, thank you. I mean, it's of course, it's probably the central question about uh, the uh, red lines. But I think once we return back in time, we also remember all those talks about Crimea and how any action in Crimea will immediately trigger Putin in some kind of exaltation that he will use arms. And we remember these lines crossed again and again. We remember how there was caution about supplying Ukraine any other arms uh, than this anti-tank for uh, a kind of uh, for partisan warfare um, type of arms. And actually, uh, interestingly enough, uh, there was recently article published, I've now cannot remember the Russian media, uh, but actually that analyzed and that showed how the rhetoric of red lines actually way, uh, faded away from the official public statements of, uh, uh, of Russian leaders. While uh, during the first year of the war, it was very prominent to speak about red lines that always appeared, like how this metaphor faded away. I mean, of course, this doesn't mean in any way that there should be some irresponsible approaches. But there also, I think, uh, clearly there is some evidence about how to proceed and not taking for granted someone who wants to present uh, themselves as a mad person with a razor in their hands and how it can be just a strategy of uh, bullying. Thank you. We'll, we'll get to this part of the room in a moment, but I want to get Stephanie Savell into the conversation. <laughs> Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for the panel. I'm Stephanie Savell. Um, I co-direct the Cost of War Project. And this is a very basic question, but I feel like we can't have a panel on the war in Ukraine without uh, talking about the human 
costs. And, um, and so I would just love to hear your thoughts. How do you understand them? Some of the work we've done for the Costs of War Project has focused recently not just on those directly killed by war, but all of the reverberating effects, right? The indirect deaths and the suffering that those indirect deaths point to on a much broader scale. Things like destruction of healthcare infrastructure, destruction of the environment, uh, ecological wreckage, um, you know, destruction of economies and people's ability to sustain livelihood, right? All of these things reverberate outwards from war. So I'm wondering, you know, if you can talk a little bit about that and also, um, you know, your best sources of information. I'm curious uh, where you would go to for this, this kind of uh, information. Um, and my, my second question is perhaps simplistic, um, but as someone who teaches students on war, you know, we, we, we need to both understand all of the kind of devastating and depressing nuances of what this, what war means. And we also need to, uh, along with that, think about where, where can we see an alleviation of human suffering and death, right? What, 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 how do we think about possibilities for that? Thank you. Yeah, Rose. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I appreciate the emphasis on the costs that were downed. And I just want to mention a couple things about the case in Ukraine. I think it's impossible to look at the case in Ukraine and not think about the massive reverberations for food insecurity around the entire world. I mean, you take out that breadbasket, and uh, Dave Pilati was talking about this to my class last night about the destruction of two different grain mills near Odessa that basically were going to cost 66 million people in Africa starvation. You know, so you have these downstream consequences you don't think about. Um, the other one that I think about is a little odd, so I'm going to tell you it's life from planet Pluto. But I think about this in demographic terms in terms of Russia. So um, Russia, um, like the Chinese, are having a demographic collapse, right? Like nobody's having kids. Um, and the Russian demographic collapse has been going on for a while, but it's accelerated. But at the beginning of the war, you had 700,000 men leave Russia. Most of them won't come back. But they weren't random who left. It's the most educated. It's the most wealthy. It's the people who can get out. And then, basically, there was an article yesterday saying that the Russian prisons are empty. Like, there's basically no one in the Russian prisons, because they've all been sent to the front. And they've all been shot. They're dead or injured. <laughs> um, and so what I think about is, um, this is going to have a generational, generational impact on Russian society, both in terms of, you know, bearing children, like having demographic support, but also, you know, without the most educated, the most wealthy part of the population, it's very difficult to reconstitute your society and, and have adequate economic development. And so those are the kind of two things that aren't direct but indirect that I think of as um, huge things. Um, in terms of the teaching piece, uh, Dave Pilati just does a fantastic job of this, and he did it last night for my class, where he starts out and just depresses the hell out of everybody for like the first 30 minutes and then talks about all the amazing humanitarian intervention going on around the world and the incredible work of the UN and the Red Cross and Doctors Without Borders and all these organizations that are just doing heroic work to try and help populations at risk. And so, um, you know, he's encouraging students to become one of those people if they're interested in doing that. And I thought that that was, you know, that was great. I couldn't, I couldn't have done that in the way that he did it, but it was amazing. Other comments about sources that you use? Or? Okay. You can no, think of, we, I, I was going to add to those, yeah. you know, to those very good comments by saying that, um, I mean, clearly the health system in Ukraine has been seriously compromised. And, uh, I mean, Doctors Without Borders is a major presence there, um, uh, including um, uh, one of our staff members in the School of Public Health is Craig Spencer, and he's senior leader in Doctors Without Borders, and they have major presence there. 
um, life expectancy. The figures are not that clear, but but uh, it's been reduced in a major way. So um, I I would cut it by ten years, in fact. So um, so you have that. So the system has been kept alive, but the expertise will drain the more this war dra uh, drags on. People will leave, um, and which is why I made the point that you you have to make sure that the skill stays, but skills stay there and have safe zones and 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 so on. So um, the longer this war drags on, the more you'll see uh, deterioration both in the health system and in the um, the people who are actually men and women um, and personnel system there. About an earlier point um, to speak just about the relationship between the South and this conflict is that Russia is part of what's known as the BRICS consortium, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. South Africa is a small party in this. They've just added a number of countries to the BRICS consortium. Um, and, and Russia has been doing a lot of work to uh, build alliances within that. You've seen South Africa's stance in this. South Africa does not trade a lot with Russia. <laughs> It trades a lot with China, so you can understand why they want to maintain that strategic interest. So there are other things going on there in terms of the relations between leaders and, and Russia, and if you look at Africa as a whole, all of that adds up to a profound worry about freedom in the South uh, and this increasing attraction to authoritarian rule, uh, and Russia certainly props up um, um, authoritarian regimes in, in, in Africa, people should, leaders that should not be there. So it raises questions about democracy, about freedom, about the things that um, that we actually cherish and, uh, and, and want to protect. And Russia is no friend along the way. So, so that reverberates um, throughout, the, certainly throughout the African continent. Uh, yeah, I mean, just one comment there. I mean, a lot has been said about disinformation, and I. You know, it is a concern, but I also, you know, I, I would on sources just tell people to read very widely. You know, uh, I don't think the mainstream media necessarily has it, has had this right or is, is let's say, objective. Certainly, as I said, like on the nuclear risk, but even on the battlefield situation, frankly, I think uh, there's, you know, honestly, this counteroffensive, uh, which has, you know, like, as I said, has been a, a large failure, but that was, you know, it should have been obvious to any military analyst, you know, to undertake a major counteroffensive without any air cover at all, it, you know, it was suicidal. And uh, that should have been called out immediately by our press. Somehow that was overlooked. Um, and many are dead as a result. And speaking of the cost of war, you know, again, I urge you to look at that Time article, which talks about how Zelensky just fired all the heads of the uh, recruitment offices because he said they were all corrupt, you know. Uh, but now they, you know, literally can't recruit anybody, and the, and the army is in, in deep trouble as a result. But other costs of war, you know, I, I think uh, food security has been talked about. I, honestly, uh, the clearest reason for the persistent inflation in our country is clearly the war. You know, we, a lot of people don't like to say that out loud, but uh, I, I think Americans have been hurt deeply by this war, uh, and that partly explains why I think now majority is is wants to reconsider this on climate. Um, climate has really not been much in the news on the front pages generally because it's been eclipsed by the wars. And and when you have this huge uh, break between the great powers and they have all these disputes about these wars, you can't uh, make room for the climate agenda. So that's being shunted aside. And then last, I'll say. Do you realize how much money we're about to spend on modernizing our nuclear forces? You know, hundreds of billions, if not trillions. And, you know, some defense uh, contractors are very happy about this. But that's your taxpayer money uh, going uh, to that future. It doesn't have to be this way. I think we, we could get back to arms control, uh, get back to peacemaking and so forth. Uh, we really need to prioritize that because uh, this is how we're spending a lot of our uh, future. Uh, we'll take a question over here, then we'll go there, and then over to Jim. And we'll keep the, just for reason of time, we'll keep the questions brief and the answers brief, and we'll get everybody in. Okay, so for all the reasons you've all been talking about, the suffering, the inflation, the risk of escalation, nuclear even, um, 
What do you think about uh, a change in American policy to try to end the war more, uh, as soon as possible by going back to the idea of, um, which I think was called the Minsk Agreements, uh, of having Ukraine neutrality, Russian withdrawal, and uh, autonomy for the Russian areas in the east of Ukraine. Is that a viable policy for Americans to adopt? And the Ukrainians will just have to accept it if we stop financing the war. And maybe from what you said, Lyle, that China would think that's a good idea. And then maybe Russia would have to accept it. So what do you think about that as a way to go? Thank you. Anybody? There are no takers. It's okay. We can go to the well, next Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll take a quick answer to it. Uh, I mean, I think you're moving in the right direction. I think as soon as Washington decided that the war needed to be ended rather quickly, I think it would be ended rather quickly. And yes, that would involve some arm twisting. And no, it would not be the first time that American leaders have twisted arms in order to make peace. You know, like I said, this is a real war. The costs are completely immense, not just to Ukrainians, primarily to Ukrainians, but also to all these other countries and to Americans. So yes, I think we should move in this direction. How to get there, very complicated. And I think some of the ideas you put on the table are there. I don't think Russia will surrender the territories they've taken up. I do think China can be quite a big part of this. How? Look, China's not going to threaten Russia. They're not going to say, well, cut off our you know, relationship with you if you don't you know, behave as it were. They're not going to do that. That's just not how they operate. What they could do is incentivize Russia, say, if you were to, you know, do some things for peace, you know, sit at that table, try to make an agreement, then China will throw in more and more carrots for you. I think that a positive incentive way to get Russia to sign off is, is the way to go. But it's, look, this is going to be a very ugly peace, uh, and everybody has mud on their face. But Putin is deeply humiliated. And again, I think Ukraine can, Ukrainians can hold their heads high and declare victory, which they have had a, a brilliant victory over Putin. Olga. Um, I think that just speaking historically wise, if Minsk agreements were to work, they would have worked. And that there are some reasons why they didn't work for the first time and why neither of the sides managed to implement it, both from the way they were formulated procedurally and also content wise. Uh, so it's, uh, I mean, it's hardly viable that there will be a desire to return, especially on the Ukrainian side, to the Minsk agreements. Thanks. Let's go to another question. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my question is for Professor McDermott. Um, you had said that you believed if um, you believed if Trump won re-election that he would, um, I think you said he would hand uh, Ukraine to Russia on a silver platter. Could you maybe elaborate more on how that would work logistically and perhaps how he would navigate <laughs> diverging opinions in Congress <laughs> and of the American public? Yeah, obviously I meant that as a metaphor. <laughs> um, but I think that the first thing you do is, um, you know, obviously we depend on whether or not the Republicans retain control of Congress. But I certainly think he'd stop, he'd do everything in his power to stop any kind of funding of money or resources or weapons to Ukraine. I think he would probably try to pressure the Ukrainians to surrender to the Russians. Um, he's clearly a friend of Putin, as you see from previous um, exchanges, including when he hung out Mike McFall in public <laughs> by saying, "Why would the Ru what do the Russians have to gain from engaging in, you know, uh, disinformation campaigns against the Americans?" So, I mean, I think that we have ample evidence. How it would work logistically, I think, is that it would just cut off any support for Ukraine and to embolden the Russians to do whatever they wanted. Why don't we go, actually, we'll go up Tommy in the back and then to, to Jim. Hi, um, thank you for being here. Quick question. Lau, you talk about getting back to arms control and to the table, but right now it seems like there are no adults in the room um, in order to get back to the table outside of China. So could you talk about logistically how that would work? Who would broker this getting back to the table to talk about arms control? Because um, Ukrainians don't have an incentive to give up their land whereas Russia doesn't have an incentive to stop going after uh, whatever their perceived gain is in this. Um, and Americans, I don't know what we're doing, but um, I'm going to pass this down. 
Yeah, no, thanks for the question, Hami. I, I think we do need you know, some adults in the room to look really at the, at the real costs of this, uh, the real um, possibilities, what's feasible. You know, I mean, the chief complaint, I think, about the war as it's going on is there is no, um, no uh, feasible way forward, you know, with the current strategy. And uh, so, you know, we, we, need to, we need to truly grapple with that, and that's very unpleasant, right, because it doesn't it makes a lot of leaders look bad. Um, for arms control, I mean, the good news, I guess, is that the, I think the strategic arms uh, agreement start is still, you know, reasonably functional and has some chance. But, um, and, and Russia, you know, Ru Russia was always spending something like one-tenth of what the United States spends on, on the military. So think about that. I mean, you know, of course they're paranoid, right? Um, they are much more stretched than we are. And they're managing a, a large nuclear force on that small bit of money, which, which may scare some of you folks because that means, you know, the, all, the, all the technology in there is sort of, uh, you know, um, what are you, chewing gum and shoelaces and things like that, and and uh, you know may may make you wonder uh, about the safety aspect of it. So you know I think we very badly need to get back in arms control. But by the way, we've been shredding arms control for um, for well over a decade. I mean George Bush, he, his name came up before he he started us down this road. Trump continued it voraciously, uh, and we've left in the past, you know uh, in the smoldering heap of arms control. You know intermediate. Uh, nuclear Forces Treaty, Open Skies Treaty, um, Conventional Forces uh, Reductions Treaty. So, so many of those, they were all valuable. And I, my read is that Russia would be actually fairly eager to get back into these uh, treaties. China is a little bit iffy. Um, they are in the midst of a major buildup, but I think they can be brought along eventually, but we'll have to, um, you know, go go a, a considerable distance to lower the temperature in U.S.-China relations, which is not easy, as Ed Steinfeld knows. Yeah. And a final question, Jim Head. I can speak loud here. Oh, go ahead. It's a quick question. <laughs> go ahead. Quick question. I'm curious um, if Ukraine can't win for fear of what Russia might do in terms of n nuclear weapons. What happens if Russia, at some other time after this? is settled, invades another company, country with Russian-speaking people, uh, Russia will still, even though they'll have been depopulated, they'll still have nuclear weapons. Yeah, and they will. Why don't you pass the microphone over, because we'll just get an additional question, and then we'll let the panel wrap up. Thank you. Go ahead, Jim. So I just had a question for Lyle real quick. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Soviet infrastructure. I mean, why would it be different? And uh, and if it if it is as it seemed to be at the beginning of the war, um, what uh, what are the implications of that for long term war, if you will? If the Ukrainians plan to stick with it, are the Russians going to run out of things? Are they gaining efficiency? Or what's the story there? So two questions: one about further Russian aggression, and one about corruption and sustainability of the effort. Sorry. No, that's all right. Go, go ahead, Lyle. All right. Um, I mean, on, uh, let me take the, that question first, Professor Head. The, uh, I mean, the efficiency question. Look, uh, clearly Russia overestimated its uh, abilities and, you know, was thoroughly embarrassed and found you know, their, their troops were, were found to have low morale and their planning was very poor uh, um, and uh, their, their war plan really fell apart really quickly in the first couple of months uh, with, with little success. And when I say, you know, Ukraine had a great victory, it's, it's really stunning and it can't be hidden, I think, even from the Russian people. So, so that's all to the good. Um, I guess the bad side is that uh, Russia has, this has been a fairly common pattern. In fact. Uh, when we spoke about, I was doing a panel like this uh, about a, what, a year ago or uh, maybe a little more than a year, we, I s compared it to the war against Finland where Russia, again, sort of fell on its face in the initial stages but then sort of learned over time and managed to improve. And I think that's what we're seeing. And 
the efficiency of Russian operations is, is, uh, seems to be improving. Uh, their tactics are improving. Their technology is improving by the way they're, you know, developing counters to a lot of our systems like HIMARS and Storm Shadow, things like that. Um, so, you know, there, I think there are, you know, real concerns going forward that they're sort of learning their way around these problems. And, and here's the thing, uh, Jim, that from the industrial point of view, this is a war of attrition, that they are running their uh, industrial factories on three shifts, uh, and they went, have gone completely into overtime. Ukraine, meanwhile, is mostly dependent on deliveries from Europe and the U.S. that are spotty, really, at best, right? And now arms going to Israel or Taiwan or wherever. So this is a very asymmetric situation and not to Ukraine's advantage. And finally, on, uh, on this point of where will Putin go next, look, it doesn't keep me up at night, frankly. You know, is he going to invade Kazakhstan or Mongolia or something? Maybe. Uh, really, his, his ambitions seem restricted from what the pattern shows us to the area of the former Soviet Union. Should we be surprised? Think about former, Soviet, uh, former Yugoslavia. I mean, this was an empire that collapsed. There's an immense amount of chaos. I mean, some might have even wanted Russian troops to go in and save Armenia from Azerbaijan's predations. I mean, it's more or less sort of chaos in these post-Soviet areas. Uh, and uh, Russia was naturally going to have some role in them. So I think it's to be expected. I don't think Russia wants to invade Poland or Germany or, you know, Europe generally. I think the Baltics are fairly safe. Um, so, look, I, I think we need to, um, uh, uh, again, I'll return to this point. I said Russian military spending is about one-tenth of that of the United States and something like one-twentieth of uh, aggregate NATO spending. So I, I really think um, this threat is overplayed and it's time uh, to be practical. Okay. Um, thank you so much for uh, your question because I think it's really one of the core questions of the whole discussion and all the developments around Ukraine. And I think here we uh, agree with Lyle that Russia, of course, will not stop. Uh, that it's clearly that it's uh, that I it will not stop in Ukraine. And we can also remember how it was the case with Georgia when everyone thought, oh, it's just an exception. Then, oh, Russia just invaded uh, eastern Ukraine. Of course, we uh, should remember actually the massacre that Russia uh, administered in Kazakhstan in suppressing the political uprising uh, within the ODKB, which happened just before the Ukrainian war, and how Russia actually failed uh, in Armenia because it was part of the peacekeeping forces which somehow didn't manage to keep the peace. And of course, I think that it's precisely what uh, we should expect that there will be, unless the, this that there is a fundamental rethinking of how the region function and how the power relations in the region are, uh, are structured, that there will be no end. And I think that uh, the Baltic countries are fairly safe until they are not. And I think that we can also remember the mood of the first weeks of the war, where so many in the West were expecting Ukraine to fall. Uh, and how there were actually already suggestions of, oh, but Baltic countries who knows uh, how the things will uh, how the things will develop and this is precisely what uh, what we are dealing with and of course somehow uh, it became such a truism but still important to think about budapest memorandum and that ukraine gave up its nuclear weapon and that now ukraine is bombed by its bombs that and by the planes that it gave to russia back as part of uh, of these deals of disarmament and this is precisely undermines ability to have any security agreement, not only in this region, but in the world. Thank you. One more. Rose? Yeah, one more. I just, just a long series of comments. I mean, they, they, when it comes to um, biological, chemical, and radiological uh, and nuclear weapons, let me just say that there could be accidents, and there's a great risk of having biological accidents. Um, the deliberate use of biological or chemical weapons or radiological weapons like dirty bombs um, will only be used by Putin if they, it can be attributed to him. Right? So otherwise, I think China would uh, react very badly to that. So that's the constraint on Putin, uh, is that. And, um, and if he's going to do that, he might as well go all the way and, and use it as a weapon to change the axis of power. 
I don't think a chemical weapon, for example, would do that. So the big state risks are around nuclear. Thank you. Rose? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the only other thing I'd mention, um, which was in response to Ethan's question, I think he, he's left, is that, you know, the United States always says that they want Ukraine to decide whether or not they, um, you know, what peace agreement they'll agree to. But there have been these kind of underground discussions in the American system about, like, well, um, what would be really great is if the regime changed in Russia, right? Like, if we could somehow get rid of Putin. And the problem, of course, is that whack-a-mole, right? Like, you get rid of Putin and you don't know if the guy who comes in in his place is, you know, even worse. And so the issue of how vibrant Russian civil society can be um, and sort of recreate any kind of, um, you know, democracy, I think, is is unlikely, but that is, the, that's the place where, you know, I think the Americans say, oh, well, the Ukrainians can win if we can overturn the regime in Russia, right, which, you know, however unlikely is the way that they try to um, uh, thread that needle, and, and I don't think that that's realistic to change the regime in Russia, but I think that that's the, that's the underlying kind of goal, um, so um, I'll leave it there. Great. Well, I want to thank you all for this important discussion. And I especially want to thank our especially want to thank our panelists, Olga Biziokova, Lyle Goldstein, Wilma James, and Rose McDermott. Thank you all.